Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today in this session 5B, Multidisciplinary Approaches to Behaviors for Achieving the SDGs. My name is, uh, is Begonia. I'm working as a research assistant at UNEP DTU Partnership, and it's my pleasure to be today the moderator of this session. Before starting with the different presentations today, I would like to give you briefly a small summary of the different housekeeping rules for today. So please uh, remember that uh, you're going to be muted while it's not your turn to talk. And also for the camera, it will be nice if you can turn on your camera when you're introducing your presentation. And as you can see at the bottom, we have this share screen function that you can easily share your presentation. I will also be happy to receive questions from the participants. And then at the end, when we finalize the different presentations, we can have a, a round of Q&A session with the different questions that we receive. And now I would like to mention that we will have uh, six different presentations uh, in this session. I would like to start with Anna Bellini, who is going to introduce her presentation on mitigation of energy poverty through consumers' behavior, pil behavior pilot actions in Italy. And just a small uh, summary of uh, her bio, Anna Rialini. She's an energy engineer working as a researcher at Ricerca Sui Sistema Energetico in Milan, Italy. And her main research interest is energy efficiency with a focus on end users' engagement. So Anna Rialini, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, I, I hope you can see my screen. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Begani said, my name is Anna Ralini and I will present the results of a European project uh, that uh, ended some months ago, uh, where we tried some uh, mitigation, uh, where we tried to mitigate the issue of energy poverty through uh, the change in consumers' behavior. Uh, the project was uh, uh, European, but uh, here I will present only the results of the pilot actions in Italy. Uh, the project was uh, uh, managed together with my colleague Simone Maggiore and with two colleagues from other companies that are Marina Varvesi and Emiliano Battazzi. Uh, so a short... I work for RSC that is a research center based in Milan with around 300 researchers working on most, mostly on energy and electrical energy issues from generation to end use and we are completely owned by a public company called GSE. And uh, in particular, I belong to the Energy Efficiency Research Group. We focus on different aspects of energy efficiency and uh, Across them, there is also energy poverty. Uh, the, our projects are mostly funded by the Italian Ministry of Economic Development and now the Italian Ministry of Ecologic Transition, but also by the EU Commission on other or other public bodies. Uh, the results I will present today are related to the Assist Together project that is an Horizon 2020 project that uh, ended last year and whose aim was to find some best practices and recommendations in order to mitigate energy poverty. And uh, the practical action that were taken was to implement a series of pilot actions through, uh, the, through a group of advisors called Home Energy Advisors that we trained and that had the goal to support vulnerable consumers in optimizing their energy consumption. The role of RSC was to coordinate the action in Work Package 5 and uh, to be teachers for the training course that we offered to the Home Energy Advisors. Uh, the project of the consortium was formed by 12 partners that represented six member states plus a European Association uh, of the Fight Against Poverty. And all the, the partners were coming both from the research and academy, from industry, and also from social sciences and third sector in order to have the widest representation all the, um, all the, all the aspects of energy poverty. Uh, the structure of the project was in uh, four phases, of which uh, two were parallel. So the first one was to understand what energy poverty is through a market survey and the analysis of the current existing policies and the future and the um, already implemented action in different European countries. Uh, then uh, we used all this information 
to um, develop the uh, Home Energy Advisors training course. So we defined who could be a Home Energy Advisor and which were their training needs. And we created training courses in all the languages, so in six languages. Um, with the aim to train 75 home energy advisors in each country, except the UK, where we have the aim of training six of them. Uh, when the training of the home energy advisors ended, uh, we worked in parallel to develop a home energy advisors network, both at the local at your, and European level. So home energy advisors could talk to each other, could uh, get in contact both with uh, other home energy advisors in their own country uh, to, I don't know, to share their experience, but also to uh, give suggestions to the others in need, but also with the European uh, uh, network in order to uh, exchange information with the with people in other countries. And uh, in parallel, assist actions were implemented by home energy advisors. So the partners defined those actions and uh, um, the home energy advisors implemented them. In all these uh, activities, we were uh, supported by expert advisors that were the Vulnerable Consumer Steering Committee uh, through think tank events that were organized periodically in order to share with them the results of the project and uh, also to uh, ask their advice on the next steps. So we prepared some proposals and we uh, discussed with them how to proceed with the project in order to optimize the effort. Uh, let's start with the training. Some words about the training. The training was performed in all countries with the same general structure, so some introductory models and then some part about energy and some parts about social system. The lectures were given by different experts. Um, for example, being a research center focused on energy, we prepared the, most of the uh, lessons about energy, while uh, uh, another partner that was more focused on the social system prepared the, the lectures about the social system and the lectures about communication, for example, and so on. And uh, um, then the... The course was fully online, but it could be uh, performed partially in person, depending on the location and availability of the experts. And also uh, was uh, uh, the same structure for all countries, but then the modules were customized based on the countries in order to be um, more specific to the local needs, but also to the local structure. For example, some classes were about how to read an energy bill. Of course, energy bills are different in every uh, country. Uh, at global level, we had a goal to register 150 people to the course and to train 75, and we reached this goal almost everywhere. In UK, the, the goal was lower, 30 registered, 6 trained, so we have a very high percentage of trained HEAs. Uh, and uh, we can see that we uh, could train different types of operators, for example, uh, in, uh, um, in Italy or in um, Belgium and Finland, we had volunteers from different uh, uh, fields, so social operators, technicians, volunteers, and so on. While, for example, in Spain, they targeted the, the courses to be mostly in presence and uh, for specific workers. So, for example, home care uh, uh, people or social services or energy cooperatives and so on. However, in total, we trained almost uh, more than 500 HEAs with a registration of almost 1,000. And this doesn't count for uh, more than 1,000 people, both in Italy and in Belgium, that received partial training and were involved in software activities. Once the HEAs were trained, uh, we had to design their uh, pilot actions. So the goal was uh, to assist 750 vulnerable consumers energy pools uh, in order to reduce their energy consumption by 7%. Uh, this was performed um, by us, but also involving the think tank workshops uh, of experts coming from different fields. Uh, uh, and uh, um, that uh, um, gave us the pro and cons, for example, of what we proposed. Um, the activities of Axis Together can be summarized in three types of activities, uh, according to what we discussed also with our think tanks. Uh, 
uh, that were the soft engagement activities with the goal to reduce the energy consumption by 2% for 2,000 consumers, the real actions, private actions, that had the goal to reduce the energy consumption by 7% for 750 consumers, and those we called synergies. So when we could intervene on already existing projects um, by providing, for example, training course for their operators and so on, with the goal uh, to save 2% uh, and we didn't have a target number of consumers because the synergies were added after we met people involved in other energy pro poverty projects that were interested in applying partially our methodology. Uh, we came out with three different uh, categories of uh, um, actions and activities, and we, uh, with the think tank work within the think tank workshops, we analyzed the time and cost effort and the pros and the cons. And the first one was the energy cafe, in which general advice was given to a group of vulnerable consumers uh, through uh, general uh, lectures, uh, through the providing of uh, material, uh, reading material that they could take home and uh, where they could apply soft uh, actions uh, or they could at least understand how um, their energy consumption works through dedicated consultancy that was, for example, a consumers association uh, consultancy at their desk and uh, with the synergy with building retrofitting. Of course, the project didn't pay for building retrofitting, but uh, the method, as I said before, those are the synergies. So for example, some uh, social houses that were already being retrofitted by some uh, local, uh, um, local um, ends, like uh, some municipalities, um, were also uh, enriched with the presence of home energy advisors that gave uh, advice to the inhabitants on how to reduce their energy consumption. Uh, these are the main results for Italy. So as I said, we performed some soft engagement activities, for example, advice at home supplies shop, energy cafes, distribution of materials to targeted consumers, consultants on financial support and general education activities performed by social workers. We performed the synergies uh, with help desks for vulnerable consumers through charity organization and distribution of material, for example, as I said, in those uh, uh, social housing that were already being retrofitted, but mostly we performed the actions. The actions that consisted in home visits and dedicated consultancy, mostly by social workers and by some health workers, and help desk counseling for vulnerable consumers, mostly at consumers association premises. Uh, the overall engagement was 8,500 vulnerable consumers with soft actions and synergies, and they were monitored in a soft way. Uh, the home energy advisors just reported that they had organized an event uh, with this much uh, uh, people, and then they had, I don't know, distributed uh, uh, some papers about how to save energy and so on. And 618 vulnerable consumers, that is a little bit less than 750 that were the goal. But as we will see in the lessons learned, uh, it was difficult to involve more people. Ha, uh, the the uh, assist action was reported in a different way by home energy advisors. They had to report the exact number of vulnerable consumers they assisted. So they assisted a family of five. They had to report uh, five people. And uh, they had to fill an uh, ex ante and ex post questionnaire. So the ex ante questionnaire had aimed at understanding how the family was consuming energy. So which was the contract they had, uh, which fuels they were using, uh, how was their house, uh, and so on. Then uh, um, the home energy advisor had to report uh, which advice he gave to the family. And after... Um, monitoring time of around, we went to, from six months to 10 months, one year, uh, they had to fill an ex post questionnaire in which they reported if any change had occurred in their energy consumption, but also in their comfort, uh, in their comfort in the home, but also uh, in their energy costs. So if they maybe changed their energy uh, contractor, they had to report it and uh, they had to report it and any change in their energy bills. Uh, as you can see, uh, this is a summary of all the activities performed in Italy. Uh, here are the, the ones that we can define as actions. Uh, the number of HEAs that we trained is very high, but at the end, as you can see, the number of actually performing action 
HEA is, is not so high. Uh, we have two, one, one, six, and so on. And some of these were doing more than one action. So uh, they uh, reported both, for example, home visits and dedicated consultancy, but also education activity at disabled pupils, pupils school was the same, one of the one HEA that did both. So uh, we can say that there was success for the course, the training involved a lot of people, but those who were the, actually delivering the action were not that many. Uh, how did we measure uh, the um, performance of our project? We uh, built two KPIs that were combining different aspects. So we had the general KPIs, how many people we involved, how many HEAs and so on, but we also wanted to know how much energy was saved and whether those people felt empowered by the action uh, they participated to. So the first one is called Assist Energy Savings Indicator. That is not only related to the energy saved by the family, but since lots of vulnerable consumers don't consume much energy, didn't consume much energy in the ex-ante situation because they were already saving energy or trying to save energy, we tried uh, to build a, a composite indicator that also measured their increased comfort level inside the homes and the quality of their lives measured by the reduction in their energy costs. So they had less uh, lower energy bills, so they could use that money for something else, for example, for buying uh, <laughs> grocery. And we found a very good results, result for Italy because our overall energy saving indicator was 5.5%, while at general level of the project it was 3.9%. And uh, But we failed a little bit in the vulnerability empowerment factor that measured how much people improved their knowledge about energy, about comfort, about energy bills, thanks to the action. It could go from zero to five, uh, we performed 0.4, while uh, uh, the average we obtained with the project was 1.3. So either our people already knew a lot before, or uh, uh, they uh, just implemented the suggested actions without, uh, um, without understanding why, probably. Uh, so the first lesson was to create a strong partnership, and if, these, um, if we had had more time, or if Home energy advisors uh, had started their training earlier because they could have come in contact with us earlier. It would have been much easier and much more effective to perform their job because we managed to find amazing networks, but it was almost the end of the project when we made contact with them. And then they performed the training, they performed some activities, but they didn't have time to perform real pilot actions. And this is strongly related to the second point that is allow more time to the home energy advisors to collect the questionnaires, the ex and the exposed, because they faced several difficulties in interacting with vulnerable consumers. They didn't want to answer, they didn't have time, the questionnaire was too long and so on. So maybe uh, having more time between one questionnaire and the other could help them in keeping the contact and uh, obtain um, more results. And the same uh, <laughs> implies the increase uh, the time between the compilation of the exant and the exposed because it allows to monitor a longer time. And so we are we could be more precise in assessing the real energy savings and comfort increase. And uh, uh, the plan of the information to send from consumers and so all the materials from home energy advisors should have been defined more in advance. And also we found quite messy dealing with different types of consumers and different types of home energy advisors. So uh, we should have done a division in target groups uh, for the consumers and also for the home energy advisors and prepare tailor-made information, but also tailor-made training. That was what was done, for example, in Spain. We didn't do that so much. We put some uh, questionnaires that were pre, uh, that were some tests that the home energy advisors could um, take before uh, some training modules in order for them to skip that module if they already knew a lot about that. But this was not very effective. Uh, so uh, the project ended last year. Our work about energy poverty has not ended. We are still working uh, together with the other partners on this topic, uh, more at Italian level. Also, other partners are working also at European level. 
And uh, I thank you for your attention. I'm sorry for the connection problem. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask. Thank you so much, Anna. Quite an interesting uh, approach and project. Uh, now I would like to give the floor to Andrea Gatto. Uh, he's going to introduce us in his presentation about sustainability, uh, sorry, evaluation of energy resilience and adaptation and economic efficiency analysis. It's a small uh, brief uh, summary of his bio. And uh, Dr. Andrea Gatto is a visiting research fellow and lecturer at the Natural Resource Institute, among other titles. And uh, one thing I would like to emphasize is please, could you um, stick to the 10 minutes because we are a little bit behind on time. Uh, but besides that, um, yeah, Andrea, the floor is yours. Sure. Thank you very much, Begonium. Um, all right. So uh, I would just uh, add that I brought this paper with Professor Aldieri and Professor Vinci. So this is a joint paper uh, that has not yet been published. And well, we can start. Uh, time is not our friend today. So uh, just a brief outline. So I will expose the research question on the paper. Uh, therefore, we will uh, quickly pass to the, exposing the theoretical model and briefly uh, going to data emitted. Uh, therefore, we will smoothly pass to results and conclusions as well as policy implications. So as Begonia was saying, this paper uh, deals with energy resilience basically, and uh, this is connected with uh, economic and environmental efficiency. So basically what we want to explore, what we wanted to explore in this paper is how, how can industry energy vulnerability affect energy security and development? Uh, that's why we run a global inquiry. So this is about uh, world countries in macroeconomic terms. And also we wanted to know uh, what determines uh, selected negative externalities uh, and what's the extent, the caliber of these. Also, we wanted to know uh, the impact on the, in this regard of technological innovation and the behavioral measures, of course, because that's also the name of the conference and our aim. Uh, especially in terms of resilience and vulnerability of local communities. So uh, we built a um, composed data set. Uh, so basically, this was a large data set that required quite an extensive uh, work. So these are all open data, but um, we apply several techniques for data treatment. So basically, we wanted to, uh, we, we, uh, we accessed uh, different war bank, war bank partners, and external um, agencies as well. Uh, data from different databases. So one is Sustainable Energy for All. Uh, more we had OECD IEA statistics, and well, doing business project from the war bank, war development indicators, and again, Sustainable Energy for All. Uh, so we basically uh, dealt with variables that were connected to access to electricity, electric power losses, electric power consumption, time to get electricity that was fundamental for businesses to estimate uh, the extent of business uh, requirements, the domestic GDP per capita and energy intensity to test. Uh, so what we did, we built panel data set made of 136 countries. So we took the most representative, uh, the ones that displayed the best data, of course. Uh, but we had a good coverage of the world, po uh, world population, of uh, world countries, uh, for both firms and countries. And we selected six variables for six years. So this made up uh, almost uh, 5,000 observations. Uh, what we did, we had several missing values, so we proceeded with two techniques, uh, basically uh, imputation, yes, uh, either with single value and the mean between the two values, or single callback imputation. Uh, this way we sorted most of the problems that we had the data set. So what happened next, uh, so we had this theoretical problem, 
to be sold. Uh, so basically, um, we had uh, we considered uh, uh, Theta in this problem as a scholar, and this is connected with decision making units. Uh, why? Because as we will see, um, this is the basis of the data envelopment analysis, the DEA. That is one of the techniques that was exploited in this uh, uh, study. We also considered constant returns to scale and variable returns to scale, and these were assumed to evaluate the energy efficiency, and therefore we uh, implemented the second technique, that is the Tobit model, uh, with the purpose to, uh, to, to, to evaluate the knowledge spillovers. So this was more, more about uh, technological innovation and the efficiency score. Okay, so uh, basically uh, we've got some quite interesting results that were favored, uh, of course, from the composite techniques and the robustness analysis that we run. So basically uh, to reach these results, energy intensity was used as output variable and electric power as input variable. And that's how it works, basically the technique that we used. And as robustness check, as I was anticipating before, uh, we considered access to electricity uh, as output var variable and electric power consumption as input variable. Uh, when it comes to energy efficiency score, uh, what we got that basically developed countries uh, evidence lower indicator than developing countries. Uh, so this is a good benefit for from uh, cheap labor and greater natural resources, uh, obviously. Uh, to investigate the extent of energy resilience uh, produces signif significant impact on distance from energy efficiency on the frontier. That's the result that mainly came uh, from the Tobit analysis. Uh, and just a recap, so we use dependent variable energy efficiency and as, as explanatory variable resilience components for the Tobit, right? Uh, so these are basically the results that we've got in a nutshell. These are some representative countries uh, from the developed and the developing world. Uh, so as you can see, the results vary in terms of energy efficiency and energy intensity and access. These are some spare results uh, regarding uh, the Tobit regression. Mm -hmm. As you can see, these are uh, here are illustrated the variables that we've used, dependent and independent. And this is the robustness analysis that we've mentioned. So basically. Uh, we've got as dependent variable efficiency score um, that is basically the access to electricity that is uh, because we wanted to examine also the social component, not only the economic and environmental component, because this is a study about sustainability, isn't it? Uh, and we kept the other variables. Hmm? So uh, we, we reached some conclusions that I can sketch. Uh, here, so basically, energy industry vulnerability, energy insecurity requires energy resilience policies. But these policies uh, require to recall for adaptation and mitigation. Uh, that is uh, often regarded when it comes to resilience and vulnerability studies. Uh, there are also primary energy resilience policies that need to be um, highlighted. Especially when it comes to energy efficiency, knowledge spillover, and environmental innovation. In this framework, it turns fundamental the behavior of the firm and the whole industry. And this is uh, essential to, um, to address the, the sector, to lead the sector. Uh, why? Because we want, in, for this purpose, to face this, um, to, to, to reach these goals, we want increased standards for energy security and environmental justice that are quite fresh. Uh, I mean, the latter and the former is already a consolidated issue. Uh, the latter is recalling, it is coming back uh, along with the climate justice movement. So it's, it's nowadays 
a fundamental issue that we want to face uh, to combating um, environmental degradation and air pollution. Uh, more conclusions. Uh, basically, firms experiencing large outages uh, coming from countries that display high energy vulnerability rates are more likely to get exposed to negative externalities of technology, uh, uh, innovation, and firms' growth. Domestically, we've got uh, insights regarding the increased sustainable development standards um, when these uh, outcomes apply. Uh, therefore, we need some firm behavior and resilience policies, uh, just as uh, policy recipe. Uh, lastly, uh, knowledge spillovers that are crucial in the study, um, especially regarding environmental connected with environmental innovation, generate uh, well. They render this result that uh, re uh, they cause uh, they are connected with uh, decreased inefficiency and increased resilience of economies that invest in cleaner in cleaner technological transition uh, these are some key references that we have been using in the study and i thank you very much yes thank you very much uh, andrea gato for this uh, very interesting presentation uh, we'd like to continue now with our next speaker, Lolita Rubens. She's going to give us a presentation on sustainability and coherence of actions aimed at a behavioral change in energy consumption. Lolita Rubens, she is an associate professor in social psychology, and she works in the University of Paris S. Cretail, and she studies on behavioral change in the environmental field. So, uh, Lolita, Please, the floor is yours. Thanks very much. I think you can see my screen. So I'm glad to present this um, study that I conducted with my colleague, Joanna Lecomte, Christelle Asgon, and uh, Raphael Salvazé in France. So it was um, uh, granted, it has a grant from the uh, French Agency uh, for Ec Ecological Transition. And it's about uh, behavioral change in energy consumption. So we um, had the objective to study the behavioral changes regarding energy when people are exposed to energy consumption information, because we have uh, right now local governments or private companies that offer a range of systems um, designed to allow access to energy consumption information. And the idea is that the feedback on energy is considered as an effective means to change uh, be, to change behavior, to promote rational behaviors, especially and render um, energy consumers more responsible. Um, so we had three different questions at mind when we started um, this study. So first, we, uh, from previous experiences, we had the impression that there was a change when people were uh, confronted or exposed to um, energy consumption information, but it was sometimes very difficult to measure it. But we had the impression that the changes were persistent. So we wanted to know, to show if uh, the, or to see if the changes were persistent when they occurred a few years before. So we had the opportunity with this panel to, uh, or with this study to to have two different panels, which was very interesting. We had a panel of what we called past participants and new participants. So the part participants had um, a previous experience with energy consumption information and the new participants were new to those type of uh, systems. And we gave access to information to both panels to see if there was a difference, if there were differences between the participants with experience and participants that were novices. Uh, the second question was about um, energy consumption information and how we can make energy consumption information easier to understand. Uh, because the um, policymakers or people in general, all the consensus view that providing information is of significant value. But we've seen again from our previous research that it's not always effective and sometimes it's very difficult for people to appropriate this information and to use it in their daily lives. So we decided to um, not use 
any unit of me measurement for electricity for energy consumption. So we didn't uh, mention any uh, kilometer kilowatts for the um, uh, kilowatt hours for the for the, um, the information. And we tried to allow learning because we uh, think and we've observed that um, to appropriate energy consumption information, you have to get this process of learning. And our last question, what about the measure? Uh, how can we measure the impact of information? Because most of the time, the measure used is energy consumption or energy savings. And we see that sometimes it's difficult to measure uh, any changes on energy consumption and savings. And we have shown before that it was not uh, the only measure that we can use. And there is something that uh, happens with knowledge, the what we call the energy culture that you develop when you uh, have access to energy information. So we wanted to measure that and we decided to use a measure of stage of change, which, which, um, which is uh, part of a psychological model on self-regulated behavioral change to be able to see the improvement or the changes um, a long time with the participants. So the methodology was multidisciplinary. We had uh, a combination of instrumentation of household, sociological surveys and psychological surveys. Uh, so first for the instrumentation, so we had um, 49 households instrumented uh, in eight different French cities in the same uh, region. We had 208 sensors that we gave to the people and it represented uh, three, um, uh, 30, 30,000 data per day. So we had a lot of data to analyze and we had a different kind of information that we gave to the participants. So we gave them the information through uh, booklets. So we had four booklets um, uh, for one year. It was one per season, uh, and the data were um, representing the month before uh, the, um, the month we sent the booklet. So we tried to uh, have something uh, very nice, booklets that were uh, very um, qualitative and quite nice to look at. So in terms of data, we used uh, daily consumption data. We had also hourly consumption data with weeks and weekend. Um, we had a synthesis of both, which is the, the mosaic that you see uh, with the different colors. So you see that we used colors uh, to um, show the amount of energy or electricity that we used. And we also had um, uh, elements on temperature, interior and exterior temperature, and also the relative humidity for exterior and interior with two sensors for each. And um, a synthesis, which uh, was uh, describing comfort for the participants with uh, so a synthesis between temperature and uh, the relative humidity. So uh, we use sociological interviews so that we can access the practices and representation of volunteer households. So we had interviews at the beginning and in the end of the research, and also after each um, household received booklets, so that we can see uh, how they understand the booklets, how the information was uh, received. But we had the objective not to change the content of the booklet so that we can have this learning process for uh, one year. And we had socio-psychological -psych questionnaires and with different types of measures, but especially the, the stage model at the, at the, in, the, in the questionnaire at the beginning and at the end of the research. So regarding the results, um, so we saw that data are only useful when they are given under a certain condition. So we have to favor or we have to have a favorable context for their for the reception of uh, of information, energy consumption information. Uh, you have to make sure that people have uh, at least a minimal awareness uh, and why not a, an energy culture already uh, created. Uh, the source, given giving the, the information, has to be identified as relevant, competent, impartial, and legitimate. 
And also the, the data have to be accessible, especially we have to propose an information that is related um, or that limits the barrier to uh, reading and appropriate the data. Most of the time, the language used is uh, an engineering language, which could be very difficult to uh, understand and appropriate by different people. So the idea of not having a unit, of, a unit of measurement, for example, was not a problem for the participants, and it can, it could, or it help some to better understand the information. <laughs> we also seen that the changes are persistent. We have um, different results according to the panel. The past participants were uh, better at reading information and at changing their practices or or. Uh, elaborating their um, their uh, culture, energy culture, and we have we had progress in both panels according when we look at the regarding this the stage model, and the uh, new participants had um, <coughs> sorry started lower, but uh, progress as well. <coughs> sorry for the. Conclusion. <coughs> I'm really sorry. Um, without um, favorable context, so we, uh, no matter how we present the data, <coughs> it does not reach its target. And the um, most important is that there is a risk of diverting information along the uh, over the long term, inducing a sense of powerlessness or failure, and we have to have more research to uh, better understand the impact of energy consumption information, especially regarding the measure. And that's okay. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Alita, very much for this presentation. And to continue with the program, I would like now to introduce three speakers, Bibiana Deruto, Mario Mosti, and Alessandro Bertirotti, who will introduce us in, his pres in their presentation about ecological education. Uh, just a very brief introduction of the three speakers. Bibiana Deruto, she is specialized in bioarchitecture and geobiology. Then we have Mario Mosti, who is a forestry doctor and wood technologist. And finally, Alessandro Bertirotti, who teaches psychology for design at the University of Genoa. So with this, uh, Viviana, um, the floor is yours. Good morning. I'm Viviana Deruto. I'm an architect specialized in bioarchitecture, and I am the director of IRSA Institute uh, Research of Living Science. And I'm pleasure to be here and um, we thanks uh, to Commission we be able to give us these possibilities to talk about our mission, the bioecological education. So uh, we understanding that climate change also depends on our daily choices is fundamental. Correcting our habits, even slight, can be deceived from food to construction, everything passed throughout the industry. But even before that show market research, the market responds to our quest, not to our mere real needs. Proper bioecological education can contribute to a low impact in, on the on environment. Okay, pardon. The current situation today is much important to understand that one of the most pollution and energy consumption comes from building industry. Cement, sands, iron require much, much more energy for their production than for the production of the natural building materials. So the current construction sector have many problems, pollution, energy consumption, environmental impact. In this project, it's important to grasp terms such as sustainable development, renewable energy, biocompatible materials, conscious use of resource. Now, it's important to understand that in all sector, but above all in the construction sector, to correct this information in order to promote the formation of a new generation aware of their choices. 
for this is necessary not only to explain but to prove that a new construction system is possible and advantages not only for energy saving but also for health reasons because health has a cost economic and environmental social and covid taught us very well the future construction sector with natural and renewable materials have many advantages, less pollution, less energy consumption, less environment impact. We uh, promote the MEV material value export research, which was included in a core wood project for wood comfort, livability, and multifunctionality of wood structure that has been developed in collaboration with the TESAF Department of University of Padua, focused on an underestimated expert, the biophysical interaction with the material present in the built environment. So, who leave the materials? In this research, there are many partners. You can see here some of us. Of, uh, of our, excuse, excuse me. The protocol of MAV research was developed by IRSA, Research Institute of Living Science, to investigate it emotional, psychological aspect and biophysical reaction, demonstrating that the materials have a real interaction with us and that building materials are responsible for the perception of comfort and well-being in built spaces. So is a new way of, way of thinking architecture, which look at the two different aspects, humans and environmental, because there isn't one without other. You can see here some photos of the uh, MAVE prototype, prototype excuse me, built with the natural materials, all at the long natural materials. Now I pass the word to my colleague, Mario Moschi. Sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to attend this work session. Uh, my name is uh, Mario Moschi. I'm a forestry doctor and wood technology. Okay. Um, everybody knows that uh, human activities affect and modify the surrounding environment. Uh, in Italy, the many events uh, over time have changed the national, European, and worldwide territories. Uh, some example, the Romans and the maritime, maritime republics, which sacked the woods from their colonies to get timber for fleets, or uh, during the two world wars, when the firewood need increased and hiked uh, trunk hardwood forests were converted in, into coppices. In all areas, different choices have influenced the environment. We are witnessing new eco-friendly phenomena, uh, such as uh, the reclaim of timber by the construction sector or advances in new building technologies. Therefore, it's necessary to invest in new research fields for such innovation as they show particularities, uh, peculiarities over time and educational program aimed at future designers. Among the project, uh, this SOFIE by the Institute for the Enhancement of Wood and Tree Species, in collaboration with the, the NIED in Tsukuba, Japan, for the cross-laminated timber panel assessment and construction use based on the, the raw material involved, seismic test on the vibrating table, fireproof test, time and building disposal analysis. Today, this approach is applied to existing and future structures as more and more often. Before recovering building, diagnostic investigations are carried out to evaluate their state, so as to intervene whether and where necessary. 
um, there are several advantages by uh, by doing that for uh, the environment to reduce the use of the new material and waste disposal for the conservation of historical architectures and uh, for the greater uh, financial saving due to intervention. This is an environmental friendly approach applicable to all building fields. But to really change people's mindset, it's necessary to turn these concepts into a nowadays uh, behavior to transmit to the next designer generation. Thank you, Viviana. Okay, now there is the um, Alessandro Bertirotti can't be present, and after our uh, when we finish our speak, uh, Begonia uh, go uh, see to you the Alessandro Bertirotti video. Now I uh, have alone uh, a little. Um, a little uh, conclusion. Uh, our goal is more knowledge because knowing means understanding and choosing material, not only for characters, but also for physic biophysical response and to save environmental. Why knowledge? If I know, I understand. If I know, I choose. If I know, I saving time, money, energy, health. I, there is the, a short time to say all. Our, uh, there is a in behind our uh, research, but uh, if you want some other um, uh, some other information, you, could, you can uh, write na, um, us uh, at the, our mail. Thank you. Thank you, Viviana. I will now share in a second, Alessandro's videos. Good afternoon to everybody, and uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here with this video. A redefinition of outdated differentiation between private space and public space is necessary because, from an anthropological perspective, point of view, we are the environment. The didactic methodology proposed also makes use in the tradition of the ancient Italian Renaissance workshops within which the relationship is translated into an apprenticeship. We believe the pragmatic teaching is important, connected with educational experimentation, and is it called in the workshops between teacher and pupil. Educating for awareness is the fastest way to influence climate change, and the anthropology of our mind can help in this process. This discipline allows us to observe the relationship existing, existing between the bioevolutionary dimension of our species, its universal and general characteristics, and the cultural destination assumed by this dimension in every region of the world. One of the problems arising from globalization, especially in the new post-COVID-19 era, is taking an individual responsibility towards the environment. The pragmatic teaching proposed could be the starting point to stimulate the constant and continuous assumption of ecological responsibility and to develop a better participation in the planet life. As a human beings, we are much more similar than one cl our claim to originality and the relationship we live with the uterus containing us, the cosmos, is seamless. The aim of a bioecological education to the bring reflection of uses that, that are often under, underestimated, but which greatly affect the real sustainability of our actions. The Earth is our common home, as we believe together. Thanks very much.
Well, after Alessandro's presentation, I would like now to introduce our next speaker, Kestje Huemna, who will introduce us her presentation on the impact of personal housing and neighborhood factors on personal well-being. Just a small introduction of uh, Dr. Gesne Hubna. She's a lecturer at the USL Institute for Environmental Design and Engineering and Senior Research Associate at the USL Energy Institute. Uh, Gesne, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Right, so I will speak about the impact of personal housing and neighborhood factors on personal well-being. This is work I've done together with my colleagues, Kenan, Taj, and Ian. All of us are based at the UCL Energy Institute and are working in the Center for Research into Energy Demand Solutions. And I just thought it would be nice to start by pointing out that well-being appears explicitly in the um, Sustainable Development Goals. So goal number three is to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages, given that we have in our session title. So if we think about um, well-being in buildings, the first thing that we are probably all aware of is that we spend a lot of time indoors. And I think for many of us, this might have even increased in the last year in the COVID restrictions. So even in normal times, it's about 90% of the times. And hence, of course, it makes sense to look at the link between the built environment and our well-being. And in fact, there have been lots of studies on this topic. And I've conducted a review of reviews, and you can see that some um, associations are very clear. So for example, there seems to be clear causal evidence that if you have greater exposure to urban green space, or greater access to urban space, green space, you have higher well-being. If you experience violence and crime in the neighborhood, that's associated with lower well-being. When it comes to housing quality, um, actually the evidence is more mixed. So correlational evidence seems to indicate that if you live in poorer housing, you have lower well-being. However, there's no causal evidence for this. And similar for dwelling type, so some studies report in the fact that if you live, in, especially in high-rise flats, you have lower well-being, whereas um, other studies don't report this effect. And in general, even though there has been so much research done, there seems to be this kind of general agreement that we have a lack of really good studies. So often there have been small samples. There's a lot of correlation evidence, but not necessarily causal evidence. And often we don't consider any covariates or any potentially confounding factors in enough detail. So having said that, I just want to say a little bit more about well-being. It's I probably could spend like 10 minutes or the 10 hours about well-being, but I guess we all kind of know what it is to be well, what well-being is. And so um, I don't want to spend too much time going into this because it's actually quite complex how it's actually defined. I just want to say that normally we differentiate between um, subjective well-being, so how we evaluate our own lives and objective well-being, which is often assessed with measures like GDP or life expectancy. And then within the sub subjective domain, we often... Um, differentiate further into evaluative well-being, eudaimonic well-being, and affective well-being. And exactly those three dimensions were measured in the data that I'm reporting on with the following four, four questions. So how satisfied are you with your life nowadays? How much do you feel that things are doing worthwhile? How happy have you felt yesterday? And how anxious have you felt? So these are the questions that were developed in the UK by the Office for National Statistics. And they're used in loads and loads of well-being and other surveys. So what we've been doing is secondary data analysis of the so-called English Housing Survey, which is a large um, survey done in the UK, which consists of a physical dwelling inspection. So someone comes around and looks at your building, but also an interview with the household. And we had a large sample, so more than 9,000 householders. So we overcome this issue of small samples. And then we looked at the how various um, predictive variables were related to well-being. And those were classified as personal factors, so your, your health, your marital status, your age, those kind of factors, housing factors, so dwelling type, energy efficiency of the home, and neighborhood variables as well. And um, we have conducted logistic regression to understand these relationships. So we can't add causal evidence. We are at this sphere of correlational evidence, but at least we have a large sample and lots of um, covariates we can control for. We pre-specified our analysis. So if you're interested in any of those details, it's all on the OFF homepage. So just looking at some results. So as I said, there were four well-being measures and they're supposed to be analyzed separately. So you're not supposed to combine them into a composite measure because they assess different 
aspects of well-being. And what these four graphs show is just the distribution of responses. So the score um, is on the on the x-axis and then the count on the y-axis. Um, and we can see for satisfaction, all the values are clustered on the right-hand side, so towards the high values, which means high life satisfaction, high well-being. Same for worthwhile and same for how happy you felt yesterday. We always find those high scores. Anxiousness is scored the other way around. So here, a low value means little anxiety and hence high well-being. And a high score would mean um, high anxiety. And we have dichotomized the outcome variable. So the red line just shows you the split off into lowish well-being and higher well-being. And also just to say that they're supposed to be treated separately, and that's what we did in our analysis. However, there are significant correlations between them. So they're not independent facets, and it remains to be discussed whether you should maybe have more combined estimate of well-being. So I will not even attempt to really go through this graph. I just put it there to have a graph of my results, but it just shows you the odds ratios for the various predictors we used. Um, but I will not spend the time on this. Instead, I will summarize the findings. So in general, for the four outcome variables, we find that we can only explain a moderate amount of variance, so between 10 and 23%, um, with the highest value for life satisfaction and the lowest one for anxiety. What we also find clearly across all the outcome variables is that personal variables explain most of the variance. So in particular, general health had by far the strongest effect on well-being. And this was then followed by housing variables and neighborhood. So they all added significantly. However, the greatest impact was clearly our personal variables. So we test the various hypotheses, and I think this makes it easy to digest. So these are the ones that were supported by the data. So we expected the well-being would be lower for householders who find it difficult to meet the heating and fuel costs, and we did find it, who were in fuel poverty, so who were unable to afford heating. We also found that. Also, those who said they were unable to keep their living room at comfortable temperatures experienced or reported lower well-being in three of the four outcome measures. Same, the ones who said they were not very satisfied with, with the environment had lower well-being. The ones who felt less safe in the local environment also reported lower well-being. And then finally, those with damp problems in the home also experienced lower well-being. So these were all our hypotheses that were supported by the data. However, there were also some that were not. So we had expected that energy efficiency of the dwelling might play a role. It didn't. Dwelling type did not. Overcrowding, so too many people in the household, also not. The index of multiple deprivation did not. And neither did the repair costs for the dwelling or surveyor assessed problems in the neighborhood. And um, I will just zoom into this a little bit. Because what this already shows two of these issues. So I pulled out the um, a model where we only tested for three variables: dwelling type, EPC rating, so energy efficiency rating, and floor area. And what you can see here, so in the middle of the, of the EPC, the EPC was not significant at all. So no matter how many of your covariates you had, it did not become significant. So clearly the energy efficiency of the dwelling did not play a role in our study. However, I just said our hypothesis on dwelling type was not supported, which is a true, it's true when you enter all the covariates. However, when you only have a very small reduced model like here, then dwelling type has an effect on well-being. So we can find that those, for example, live in high-rise flats or converted flats have lower well-being than the ones who live in detached homes. And I think that's quite important because it tells us that a lot of our results will depend on our covariates. And this brings me to the summary. So we found that personal variables explain most of the variance in well-being. Overall, we can only explain a limited amount of variance. Lower well-being was associated with difficulty meeting fuel costs, being unable to keep the living room warm, being in fuel poverty, having lower neighborhood satisfaction, and lower perceived safety of the area. And there of course, various limitations. So as I said earlier, we only have correlation evidence, so we can't make any causal statements. Some important variables were not available, so we did not have local data on crime, for example, even though we know that's an important variable. We also did not have any measured data of environmental conditions, so we did not measure, we did not have data on local air pollution, for example, which could have also played a role. 
based on these results, um, we consider the following implications. So first of all, there are some policy implications. And the first one is if we want to target, let's say, areas for well-being interventions to try to improve well-being, this is actually quite difficult because the data that's easily available, such as dwelling type or EPC rating, only plays a small role in um, identifying those with potentially low well-being. So it's actually very hard to have any targeted interventions. It's really important to focus on multiple spheres. So personal variables are most important, but also housing and neighborhood variables playing a role. So very clearly, we should focus across the board. And then finally, that's something that's kind of obvious and that we've heard many times, but this study supports this. It's really, really important to ensure that people have warm homes and affordable heating. In terms of research implications, I think it's really important to be aware of that kind of depending on how you define well-being, different variables will play a role differently. So we kind of need to have an agreement what we actually mean by well-being, how we should measure and target it. Finally, results also depend on covariates, um, which covariates are being included, as we've seen at the example of dwelling type, for example. And then um, it's also possible that we just did not consider certain covariates given the low amount of explained variance. That's quite plausible that we just some that's something we are overlooking and missing. And with this, I'm at the end. I'm looking forward to your questions now or later. Thank you so much, Yastia, uh, for this interesting presentation. You are right, well being, it's a very deep topic that could uh, give us for another <laughs> conference. Um, so after your presentation, I would like to introduce uh, our last speakers of today, Alessandra Luna Navarro and Isabella Gaetani. They will introduce us in the topic of uh, can we make our office buildings more responsive, energy efficiency and behavior in the post-pandemic office. And just a brief introduction of uh, Alessandra. She's a postdoctoral research associate at the Faculty of Architecture and Build Environment in TU Delft. And Isabella, she's a senior scientist working within the Arab Smart Buildings team in the London office. The floor mm -hmm. is yours. Thank you very much, Begonia, for the introduction. I trust you all can see my screen and hear me. Yes. Um, and if not, yeah. Great. So um, I'm Isabella Gaetani from Arab London, working, as Begonia mentioned, in smart buildings and energy. And here is my colleague, Alessandra, from Tudels. So today we will try to answer a very sort of uh, broad and large research question, which is how did we and our offices really react to the COVID-19 pandemic? And what I will show you today is sort of like some preliminary results of our studies. And um, yeah, and I hope that they will offer some good insights. So we looked at three Arab offices. We were looking at London, Tokyo, and Melbourne, and both from the energy and satisfaction or well-being point of view. So in terms of energy, we selected these three offices because we really needed you know, offices to be back since 20, um, energy data to, to be available since 2019 in order for us to be able to compare them like pre and during the COVID pandemic. And then Alessandra will make a sort of focus into one team out of our London office for which there were satisfaction surveys available pre and during COVID-19. So just to give you an idea of the offices that we looked at, so we had Melbourne, which had maximum occupancy of 450 people for a size of about 5,600 meters square. We then looked at Tokyo, which has, again, maximum occupancy about 100 people and size of 630 meters square roughly. And London, which is our headquarters, and actually this is one of the two buildings of our headquarters in London, so it's a very large building, 16,000 meters squared, and maximum occupancy of about 2,000 people. So what we tried to investigate was really how much savings um, these buildings were performing because of the lower occupancy. And what you see here is basically the energy savings per month compared to the previous year for Melbourne, Tokyo, and London. So for example, what you see is we're starting at April 2020, so this was the first month of lockdown for all of the three cities, so for the three offices. And for example, you see that Tokyo, which is the dark gray thing, um, in April 2020, consumed 
10% less energy than in April 2019. Then this is basically how you read the graph. And this is quite telling in the sense that we know that the occupancy levels for all of these offices across the, the data that you're seeing here was zero to 10% of the usual. And you have here a little exception with Melbourne because from the 1st of December, actually 25 of workers were allowed to be back in the office in Melbourne. But what you see is that, you know, you have these offices that were nearly empty, so zero to 10% occupancy. And you could imagine, you know, having energy use then zero to 10%, obviously, if you were a slightly naive. But, um, but what we saw is that this was not at all the case. So for example, in Tokyo in April, despite the office being empty, it was still consuming up to 90% of its original full occupancy energy. So what you also see here is that obviously these curves are all positive in the sense that there were always savings, which is obviously a good thing. And another very good thing is that there is a learning factor. So you see that there is a positive trend of all these curves. So there were more and more savings, which means that basically the facility management was actually learning how to improve the flexibility of our buildings because of occupancy. So we try to then have you know further understanding of why the savings were happening and which kind of loads were more and less flexible to the switch um to let's say the swings in, in occupancy and what you see here for example for the melbourne office i will show you also some london data basically like the first the graph above is kind of pre-covid and in this case you're seeing a typical like all the weekdays basically pre-covid and the graph below is during the COVID pandemic. And you're looking at light and energy use, but then I will show you also some other flows. So what you see is basically there is like kind of signature of the building pre-COVID. And the signature, this curve is basically the same, just like has much lower peak um, during the, the COVID pandemic. And you see that there is also much higher variability of the energy because of lighting during the COVID pandemic as in respect to before. So a much more flexible load is actually the plug loads load. So you see that there was a very defined again profile before the pandemic. And then during the pandemic, basically you have a flat curve always around the base load. So you see also the importance for the flexibility of your offices of this base load. So make sure that you know during the night or in absence of occupants, what's the amount of energy <clears throat> that you still anyways um, would use. And then we looked at the mechanical loads. And in the case of Melbourne, you see something quite similar to let's say the lighting load. So I'm telling you quite qualitatively at the moment. So what you see is a very defined profile, um, higher variability when it comes to during the COVID pandemic, but basically pretty much the same profile, just kind of a shift in the peaks. So similar results, of course, with very different uh, let's say access values were noticed for the London office. And in this case, you had, you know, again, like a very defined profile when it comes to lighting before the pandemic and a very, very high variability during the pandemic that led, however, to quite a similar profile, just um, little lower peaks. Also, in this case, the plug loads were extremely flexible. So well done just on the base load and hopefully everyone um, managed this very well. And quite alarming situation when it comes to the mechanical load. So, this may have to do with the facility management that was attempting, in fact, to actually react to the lower occupancies by switching on and off the systems and by trying different settings. But obviously, this actually had a very sort of bad impact. And in fact, even the curve was quite similar to, although there were many more variations, but the curve was quite similar to the normal occupancy hours. So we'll now pass the word to Alessandra, who will tell you something about satisfaction. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you very much. So we're going to have now a look to um, a closer look to a specific team, a specific sp uh, part of the office in London. So obviously, uh, we'll emphasize the limitation that the data I want to show you is obviously very context dependent on the context we were looking now. So uh, we cannot very generalize findings. So when the pandemic started, we were already in a good position in understanding the occupant satisfaction with indoor environmental quality in, in the office because we had already started a measurement campaign 
that was part of my PhD at the University of Cambridge in collaboration with Arup and from Astilisa and the CTDB and EPSRC. So when the pandemic started, we had already nine months of data on um, by monitoring the indoor environmental quality with bespoke sensors, which are the one you see in the pictures, and also asking to occupants through either long services or high frequency questionnaires, the, the satisfaction either with the environment or with other factors such as satisfaction with the level of workload and so on. So the first uh, that I would like to show is that in general, for instance, for this office, we already, um, there was already some occupancy variation inherently in the building. So even before the pandemic, the office was, wasn't always at the maximum level of occupancy. And actually there was a very nice week of the day pattern. So which also emphasized the need for a flexible building that can react to variations in occupancy that of course won't be as, as larger as we've experienced with, with the lockdown, but are inherently in our buildings. So the data I'm showing here is data from three data collection uh, that we did. One, the first one is, uh, was within the nine months of monitoring I just showed you before, and it was for uh, in, in May 2019, these particular data points. So a year before the lockdown started, basically. Then we, we went on with the volunteers with the data collection through questionnaires when they moved to the working from home. So in April 2020, where we, they were just went back home for the lockdown. And in June 2020, where they were already for two months working from home, so they were more used to the situation. So overall, as you can see, the environmental satisfaction of occupants was higher when they moved to, to, to working from home. Obviously, this will be very individual and will depend on the context also, uh, uh, their house uh, versus their office and so on. But uh, we shouldn't take this as a sign that working from home is better. It's just that their environmental satisfaction with the office was low. And so there is all very much to question which kind of experience we were looking to have before the pandemic started in the office and what we are expecting now uh, when we, are, we will be back to the office. There, were a few, there was one thing that went worse when we started to work from home and it was the satisfaction with the level of workload because as we all have experienced, we are working for many hours more or, act, or at least more intensely than before. So in many situations, in many cases, satisfaction with the workload was much lower. So do people prefer to work from home or in the office in this specific task uh, group that we were looking at? So the volunteers in general rank at working from home higher than working from the office, but it's also true that when we ask them actually which solution they would prefer, if being just at home, being just at the office, or an hybrid solution, um, they chose the hybrid solution. So the majority chose, the chose to be flexible, to have the flexibility to decide which days of the week being at home, which days of the week being at office. So flexibility was the, the good, let's say, lesson learned from uh, this uh, pandemic situation. So to conclude, uh, for sure, occupancy variation is inherent in our buildings, despite of the fact that the, we are in a pandemic. And obviously now that we go back to the office, this will continue and the extent of this variability is, uh, will, will still be high. So there are some advantages. So it is very important that we develop ahead the right policies to ensure occupants have the flexibility to change within the, the, the working environment, because this uh, seems to be uh, very well received by occupants. Of course, we will need to change the way we think of our office because now that we go back to the office, we need to think to improve our office emphasis needs to offer a unique experience, a much better environmental quality because they need to act as a destination. But Isabella, which are your conclusions from the energy effects of this high variability in occupancy? Thank you, Alessandra. So yeah, currently this is still quite an alarming situation in the sense that despite occupancy having values of zero to 10%, buildings are still using 90 to 40% of the original full occupancy energy. 
And whereas we're still a learning factor, we're still quite a long way from having fully flexible operations. And I think here is very important to concentrate on actually the signature of your building. So how is your building performing when it's full occupied? And also on the base load, so how can we reduce this? And of course, there is a lot of conflicting, um, let's say, stakeholders to this. So just a sort of concerted action will be able to, to provide us flexible offices. So thank you very much for your time and we look forward to your questions. And if you don't have the time or here, you can still reach, um, reach us per email. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isabella and Alessandra. And I would also like to thank you all the speakers for the very interesting presentations. Now I would like to uh, initiate uh, the Q&A session, just one second. Yes. And we have uh, received, oops, sorry. Yeah, we have received uh, some questions. Uh, I welcome speakers to turn on the cameras uh, so we can have more like an open dialogue. We don't have much time, but um, at the beginning, we received a lot of questions from Anna Realini, and I could see through the chat that you reply some of the questions. But yes. I would like um, now to mention two questions that I didn't see a response. Um, the first question is, how the users can improve the learning empowerment factor? Okay, uh, uh, the response I gave, and I, I think it, is that uh, probably um, we didn't deliver them the information in the right way for them to understand and apply it. I mean, uh, we gave them some information sheets, we gave them some information, but either they were too long to read or they were too complex, so they didn't understand them well. And so I think they felt discouraged uh, into reading them and applying what they read over there. And they just preferred uh, to listen to what the home energy advisor said, implement that, but uh, without uh, being uh, um, involved that much or believing that much what they were doing. Thank you so much, uh, Anna. Another question, I believe it hasn't been responded uh, in the chat. How the vulnerability empowerment factor corresponded to well-being improvement, if that was measured? Uh, okay, uh, I we didn't correlate the vulnerability in, in empower the vulnerable empowerment factor to the comfort improvement, but uh, we we will do that or we can check on that. Thanks for the question. We didn't think about it. Thank you, Anna. And a um, quest, uh, question that I can see in the chat that I was mentioned not long time ago is a question for Isabella. Did you weather correct the energy consumption before making the comparison before and after? Yes, in fact, it was a little bit um, more difficult to show just with one slide what we did, but we also looked at the sort of heating degree days and cooling degree days in the different cities. And you could see that the swing actually was very, very small. So I thought I would just show you that one figure. But yeah, we, we did that basically by looking at the degree days. Thank you so much, Isabella. And personally, I have some questions. Uh, I will start with uh, Andrea Gatto. So, um, Andrea, I would like to ask you, uh, which were the most significant strengths and the weakness of the methodology that you applied uh, during your research? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, well, of course, the, the, the robustness analysis, because this is something that is prescribed in the related literature. So um, also we aimed to combine um, quantitative insights uh, with some qualitative insights. I didn't focus much on the qualitative insights, but uh, we aimed to analyze all the countries, basically. Uh, I mean, it's 136 countries. So, you know, we attempted to make a qualitative cluster regarding this, especially regarding the question that I think Isabella posed, that I already addressed during my presentation. Uh, but basically, we have this uh, possibly counterintuitive counter uh, result. So we basically have that in the robustness analysis, uh, developed countries have lower indicator of energy efficiency score related to uh, access to electricity 
but this is related to, as I mentioned, to probably to cheap labor and great uh, natural resources. So I think these are the strengths. Uh, basically, the data envelopment analysis per se is reputed a quite strong technique to be used in uh, policy efficiency analysis. Thank you so much, Andrea, for this uh, explanation. Uh, I would like now to ask something uh, to Lolita. Uh, Lolita, uh, what would be important to say or your main message from your study to all policy, regarding to policy makers? Yeah, I think the, the main message would be that most of the time we consider that uh, information, energy consumption information, um, are useful, as I said, and giving them to the um, to the people would be either positive, like the people would appropriate the information and it would be good, or neutral, like it would not do anything, so it's not a problem to give information, either it's positive or neutral. Whereas what we see in our research is that it could be it could have a, a bad impact, a negative impact, where people could feel helpless. Um, being helpless, um, not understanding the, the data and decide to not look at consumption for a long time afterwards. So it could be very negative for the, the policymakers to create this situation or this link to energy for the people they want to uh, sensibilize. Thank you, Lolita, for these uh, very great insights. And we have one more minute until we finalize this session, but I just have two last questions, and I think we can spend two more minutes. Um, so this is a question for Bibiana Deruto and, Alison, uh, sorry, and Mario Mosti. It's a curiosity that I have um, regarding your ecological education project, and I was curious to know if you have identified potential schools to apply uh, your educational program that you, you are mentioning in your, in your research. Uh, you're muted, Viviana, in case you're talking. Excuse me? Yes. Yes, we have many projects for the future, and um, the, um, we make a new project uh, called HIV uh, to uh, promote the, the ecological education with uh, the um, uh, University of Padua and uh, with other institutes, and from IRSA, the Institute of Research of Living Science, because uh, we have made a um, research long for uh, four or five years. And so uh, we, we have one publication on the uh, international uh, review, and after we um, must uh, go to another publication and after we can go with uh, the program. Excuse me for my English. <laughs> no, it's okay. And this is quite inspirational. Thank you so much, uh, Viviana, for this. And my last question is for you, uh, Gesche. Uh, I'm very curious to know uh, because as I could read in your abstract, you apply this to English households, right? Your study. And I was just curious to know if there's uh, any plan or any expectation to extrapolate your analysis to low income regions, which I can expect the results might not be extremely different, but might bring very uh, insightful results. If there's any plan on this. No, I mean, not, my, not on my behalf. So this was secondary data analysis. I didn't, con I didn't construct the survey and everything. And um, I'm sure there are, there are some works on this in, um, in other areas and re regions. I think most research has generally been done in kind of like Western countries. But of course, it would be very important to uh, extend this. And I think that, for example, something like the Gallup poll, you know, this huge worldwide survey um, that also focuses on well-being, and they do include some information on like living conditions as well. We'll probably give some some insights into this, but I haven't worked on that. Would be interesting too. Thank you, Yes. Uh, well, um, thank you everyone, the speakers and the participants uh, to join me today in this session 5B. Uh, now I welcome you to join the main session. Our following sessions will start at three. We will have now a coffee break. So I wish uh, I will see you there. Okay, thank you so much. Thank have you, a great Patricia. day. Thank bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you.